afternoon. My name is Glenn Vanderberg. Um, uh, I am playing the role of the enterprise guy today. Um, decided to dress the part. Um, the, uh, so Rubyists have uh, an awkward and strained relationship with the enterprise. Um, uh, well, well, actually, before I get into that, uh, I want to quickly get the blatant self-promotion stuff out of the way. I work for Relevance. Uh, we do a hosted called Run Code Run. Um, we think it qualifies as not an enterprisey tool. So uh, there you go. Um, uh, Rubyists have this awkward kind of strained relationship with the enterprise, and some of us uh, want, and in fact, quite adamantly want, nothing to do with it. And um, others want to break in and sell to the enterprise market and sell our services there and do things like that. Hey, Glenn, you're cutting in and out. I'm cutting in and out. I've noticed some clicking and stuff. I guess that's what it is. Don't touch your side. Keep your hands above your head. You don't touch my side either. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, some want to break in and sell to the enterprise market. Some, some want nothing to do with it. Some of us in the Ruby community are in the enterprise and want Ruby to break in and be able to play there. And, and it's happening uh, to a greater or lesser degree. And uh, some of us are outside the enterprise, but we would love to be the savior and help our enterprise brethren throw off their chains and... Uh, um, be free within their environment. Um, so, uh, a couple of years ago, um, there was uh, Joe O'Brien, who I don't guess is in this room, um, and Edge Case hosted uh, a conference in Columbus called eRubyCon that was focused on Ruby and the enterprise. And um, I gave a keynote there. Why is that relevant? Well, the talk I'm giving today, uh, I actually gave there earlier this year as a sequel to that first talk. And uh, so in order to set the stage, I need to talk about the first talk for just a little bit and, and kind of let you know where I was coming from. Um, the first talk was called Enterprise Shim Enterprise. And uh, the thrust of the talk, the, the conference as a whole was, is Ruby ready for the enterprise? And So, um, yeah, I'll stand just like this. Um, this is why I don't like microphones. Um, so the talk was called Enterprise Shim Enterprise, and it's, the conference was about is Ruby ready for the enterprise? And I had developed this idea that the problem with Ruby and the enterprise, the mismatch between Ruby and the enterprise, is not Ruby. It's the enterprise. And furthermore, Maybe even that's not the case. Maybe it's that um, the enterprise. <laughs> Maybe it's that the enterprise doesn't really know what they need, and they've been sold a bill of goods, so to speak, about what enterprise software is and what enterprises need uh, to build software. And so that was really the topic of my talk, and. So the, the enterprise tool market summarized, here are tools that will let you build software quickly, cheaply, and with below average developers. Um, that's a bit cynical and overstated and oversimplified, but you know, that's not too far from the truth. And, um, but really, if there's, uh, there's anything that enterprise, enterprises need to know about their software is that most of the challenges of enterprise software are about the enterprise and not the software. And, if there's anything, you know, big enterprises or more commonly big enterprise tool vendors, uh, when they talk about enterprise software, they talk about high volumes and scalability and manageability and this and that and the other. And, you know, none of the stuff we work on has any of those problems, <laughs> right? It, it, in those respects, enterprise software is generally no worse than little startup software or, or some of the kinds of things we do. And in often case, uh, the challenges are much easier 
in enterprise software, when you're in a constrained environment building intranet applications and things like that. Um, so, so the common enterprise idea of what is different about enterprise software I think is dead wrong. And really if there's any one characteristic that enterprise software has that the rest of the software we build does not, it's that if you're writing enterprise software, you have to assume your code will still be in production in 30 years. You'd like to assume it won't be, but you have to kind of assume that you're going to write that and stick it out there and who knows what's going to happen and who's going to have to be maintaining it and keeping it up to date and integrating it with other things for a long, long time to, to come. And maybe 30 years is an exaggeration, but uh, I think you get the point. And if there are tools that are really well suited to being enterprise tools and, and solving more problems than they cause, then those tools need to help us solve that problem and not the typical problems that enterprise tools are aimed at. Um, and finally, I closed with this great quote from Kent Beck that I, I just always pull out. Um, Listening, testing, coding, designing, that's all there is to software. Uh, anyone who tells you different is selling something. So then, now it's time for this talk. Um, when I'm talking about um, existing enterprise tools and, and big tools for the enterprise and exactly why they are bad for the enterprise uh, instead of as they are sold, uh, being just what the enterprise needs. Um, we're going to talk about the enterprise tools. This isn't a particularly Ruby heavy talk, but those of us, well, in fact, it's a Ruby uh, agnostic talk, more or less. But for those of us who are doing uh, Ruby work and uh, working in enterprises or trying to sell our services into enterprises, or in some cases trying to build libraries and tools that help Ruby meet enterprise needs, I think this will be valuable. Um, I think most of us are in a position to care about uh, the relationship with Ruby and the enterprise, uh, even if we don't actually want to be playing in that space. Um, so uh, by way of giving credit, a lot of this work came out of a project that we did with Verizon Business, which, uh, boy, if there was ever a big enterprise-y customer, um, that's it. And we learned a lot from this, this project, and I want to make it clear uh, the way we learned this was not uh, by watching what uh, Verizon Business did and saying, boy, <laughs> you want to do anything but that. Um, they've actually been a really good customer for us in a lot of ways, and the group we're working with um, is not very enterprisey, but they have a, a big concern about how their enterprise works. They see how we work compared to the way they work, and they wanted to talk to us about how maybe they could learn some lessons from the way a small Ruby shop develops software and improve their efficiency and, and uh, responsiveness and, and things like that. And we worked together with them to think about it. And um, they actually, there have been a lot of companies that have looked at bringing agile methods or you know, agile tools or lighter weight tools or whatever into big enterprises. And it, it um, they tend, I think, to usually have the wrong focus. And Verizon had just the right focus, which is, which was, uh, they didn't come at it as how do these tools and methods need to change to meet us. It was how do we need to change to meet them. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we discussed. And, and uh, part of it, uh, one of the guys we were working with there um, led me to learn a lot about the way uh, American manufacturing changed uh, in the 1970s and some of the roots of that movement and how we might apply it to, not directly to software today, but to thinking about software today. And of course, a lot of people are doing this, but uh, I'll give an overview. Um, this is a picture of a United States factory in the 1970s. Well, maybe not, but... Um, so uh, manufacturing in the 1970s was in the doldrums in the United States and our, our butts were being kicked by uh, uh, Japan and Germany and, and um, uh, other countries that kind of had a, a better view of what manufacturing was all about. And a lot of things and a lot of people went into kind of changing this to the extent that it changed. And it did uh, uh, changing it a lot better. Um, but one of the key insights was um, a complete change in the way uh, inventory was treated for the purpose of accounting. Uh, at that time, inventory was treated as an asset. 
And it's easy to see how this might be, right? You had raw materials coming into your factory and you were assembling them and thereby adding value to them and the inventory was a completed product ready to sell. Or, in some cases, a partially completed assembly that was much further along towards being ready to be assembled into a completed project. Therefore, it was farther along the line from raw material to generating value from the for the company and uh, it was treated as an asset. What people began to realize is that, um, or was, that uh, that way of thinking about inventory put a lot of the wrong incentives in place for people in a manufacturing business. If inventory is an asset, we want more of it. And uh, so we'll ramp that up. And there are all kinds of hidden costs that go, and, and as I'm telling this story, I want you to think about software development in enterprises. There are all kinds of thoughts uh, of costs that go along with having a lot of inventory. And some of them are obvious and some of them are not so obvious. The obvious cost is uh, storage of this inventory, warehouse space. Um, a less obvious cost is sort of clogging up, especially if you have partially assembled inventory, uh, clogging up your factory space and making it difficult and, and more time consuming for raw materials to move in and out and people to uh, get from one place to another to get assemblies from one part of the line to the next part. Um, an even less obvious effect of having a lot of inventory is that it really puts a, a negative pressure on your R&D department. If we introduce something new and improved now, everybody's going to want that, and nobody's going to want these last generation products we have sitting in the uh, warehouse ready to be sold. And so um, that'll mean we have to take a huge loss on that eventually. So we've got to hold these new developments and new products back and not announce them until we can, can sell off this inventory. But meanwhile, the factory is still generating more of that inventory because the incentives are made on a departmental level rather than on a whole company level. And um, your customers, perhaps, or your competitors, perhaps, are going full speed ahead with their research and development and introducing new products. And so, um, shockingly enough, uh, some people were able to get this idea across and generally today, inventory is treated as a liability and there's been a lot of work put into um, just in time, you know, kinds of inventory management and, and supply chain uh, thinking and, and uh, completely retooling factories, but not just factories. Entire, the entire enterprise, uh, manufacturing enterprise, uh, including the bean counters and how they keep track of things on the books and which part of the balance sheet inventory goes on uh, in order to set the right incentives in place and change the way uh, manufacturing works in in uh, manufacturing enterprises and uh, make them profitable. So um, we started thinking about uh, how Agile would work in large enterprises and, and tools like Ruby and things like that. And um, uh, we, we looked at it in both ways. How might the enterprise change to meet uh, Agile methods and, and lightweight tools like Ruby and, and faster ways of building software? Um, and we started with uh, the Agile Manifesto, which is always you know, a good place to start when you're thinking about these <coughs> things. And um, uh, we noticed uh, something kind of interesting, and, and, and I buy this, and I strongly suspect most of the people in this room buy most of these value statements here uh, on the manifesto. But we noticed this interesting. I made a gesture. Um, we noticed this interesting thing about the very first. <laughs> notice this very interesting thing about the very first thing here, which is you know we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, which is uh, you know a good point. But we love our tools, don't we? Um, we pay a lot of attention to tools. Okay. I'll go with the hand mic. Um, we pay a lot of attention to tools. We love our tools. We're devoted to our tools. We're passionate about our tools. To say that we don't value tools is ridiculous. 
So there's something deeper going on there. And as we, we went into this effort, we, we, we considered the fact, you know, um, the kinds of agile practices that we follow in most of the small businesses and, and um, startups that a lot of us work for are um, sort of how these principles get manifested in a particular environment, in a particular context. But maybe in a large enterprise, these principles are going to generate slightly different practices. So Agile might reasonably look a little different in that context. But at the same time, we wanted to think about how the context needed to change to meet Agile tools. But we focused a lot, there were a lot of insights that came out of this project, but we focused a lot on the tools aspect. And we focused on why it is that um, many of, or if not most, of the best and most passionate developers in our industry care a lot about little tools like this, and big enterprises are very skeptical and don't like to touch them in general. So I want to talk about several different ways that enterprise tools turn out to be not just you know, less effective than these tools, but in fact downright harmful for the enterprises in which they're used. First thing I want to talk about is context switching cost. Um, and when I talk about context switching, uh, please, you know, don't get this confused with multitasking, right? Uh, multitasking has big <laughs> downsides in a lot of ways, and um, the idea is not to do a lot of things at one time, but the idea is that we do have to switch from doing one kind of thing to another, and we want to reduce that context switch cost. And um, uh, people have done psychological studies of programmers, and one of the th characteristics uh, of good programmers is that we tend to be able to mentally switch gears quite easily, uh, both from low levels of abstraction to high levels of abstraction and from different uh, one aspect of our system to another and from you know the activity of coding to testing to debugging to going and reading a spec and finding out how that API call works and uh, all those different things. And so one characteristic of tools that are good for good software developers is tools that help us to context switch very cheaply. Tools that start fast, tools that allow us to drop in, do win one thing and get out and switch back to a different tool. Um, most of the good programmers I know um, have pretty heavily worn alt and tab keys on their keyboards, right? Um, and big enterprise tools tend to be, um, you know, take a long time to fire them up, and once you do fire them up, you have to get in and, and click here and click there and click there, and um, then it wants you to do more, and stop and write documentation here, please. And um, also, it tries to do a lot. Uh, it wants you to kind of stick in this tool and use this tool for a lot of different activities, even though it might only be good for one or two of them. Um, another way to think about this is, you want tools that uh, are very easy to just hop into and hop out of. Um, a vehicle like this is a good model for the kind of software tools that uh, are really good for rapid software development. Um, they're specialized, uh, you hop in and you hop out, uh, as compared to you know, a different kind of vehicle that uh, getting into and getting out of is uh, quite a chore, and in fact, once you're there, you want to stay for a while or you've sort of missed the point. Good software tools tend to do one job at a time. And big, expensive, costly enterprise tools um, try to do a lot. I'm not particularly happy with this picture because the intent is to uh, you know, show something that does, tries to do too much and is a bad idea, and frankly, I would love to have that tool. <laughs> but I think you get what I mean, right? Uh, I actually found a lot, uh, a lot of pictures that illustrated my point better, but that one was just so beautiful I had to go with that anyway. Um, uh, we have uh, a design philosophy in our code of you know, do one thing well. A class, a method, a test, or a tool. Should pick one thing and do it well. And um, 
You get multiple things that do one thing well, and you put them together uh, to work together, to do a larger thing well. And that philosophy works really well for our tools as well. And enterprise tools um, uh, tend to try to do a lot all at once. Why is that, do you think? You can charge more. You can, um, yeah, I, I think that's the big reason. I, there, there are a lot of ancillary reasons uh, that, that support that. Um, but, but I think that, you know, unless it does a lot, you can't charge much money for it. So uh, let's, let's bundle some more things in. The feature checklist. One illustration of, you know, the right kind of tool is um, it's often very hard to explain to, you know, for want of better words, enterprisey types why we need both RSpec and Cucumber, right? In, in so many ways, they seem like they're attacking the same problem. But we like them both, and we use them for what to us seem like very different things. And uh, one excels at one kind of testing, and one excels at another kind of testing, and they use different vocabularies, and, and um, uh, this is a very fine granularity, I think, of tool specialization, but it doesn't feel too fine to me. It feels just right. And um, uh, uh, enterprises uh, would prefer to have uh, just a few tools uh, that each do a lot than a whole bunch of tools that do one thing well. And yet, I think that ultimately the, the few tools that do, do a whole bunch uh, is a harmful strategy. I want to talk about two kinds of craziness. <laughs> Typical enterprise tools, the, if, if you read the, spe, the, the, the sales brochure about what they're going to do, um, what, what they will do for you, what they allow you to do, um, you'll almost always find something in there that's like, oh, cool, but why would you ever want to do that? And I'm not sure it's a good idea. And um, in the effort to throw more and more features in and uh, uh, build up that sort of you know, sales checklist, um, you end up with do-everything tools that, that uh, uh, try to do some frankly crazy stuff. And um, we, all, we all know how businesses are once they've spent money on something. They want to use it. But it's a bit facile to blame that for the fact that when given these tools, programmers do crazy things. Uh, because when we have a tool in front of us and it does something, we like to use it too. But there's another kind of craziness, and it's a craziness that's actually good and that um, enterprise tools usually prohibit, which is the craziness of completely stepping outside the box. Um, when I look at things that have happened in just the Ruby uh, part of our field over the past few years and the changes that have come about and some of the, you know, what, what a lot of enterprises would see as really complicated deployments with, uh, you know, Nginx and Thin and then Rails running behind that and uh, um, uh, Redis server out there and uh, uh, the database and um, you know, a, a, a solar instance running that you uh, push indexing and search requests to and stuff like that. Um, that's the kind of crazy things, crazy things, that developers need to do to solve problems quickly and efficiently. And yes, it's a little complex, but it, in every case, it's, you know, picking a, a little tool that'll do the right thing instead of, instead of having to implement it all yourself or integrate it all into one big thing and integrating those tools together in lightweight ways and um, you end up with something that's actually really powerful and flexible and in every case, or at least in most cases, we're trying to use the right tool for the job. And the typical enterprise software development tool actively prohibits that kind of branching out and experimentation and growth and uh, uh, using small pieces loosely joined, so to speak. There are kinds of craziness that uh, we, we'd rather not be pushed into, but at the same time we'd like to reserve the right to be a little crazy sometimes when it seems appropriate. 
Um, not long ago, uh, I probably shouldn't even start this unless I'm sure I can remember the whole story. Um, but, you know, e every now and then there's uh, uh, media outlets and, and media companies, newspapers, um, uh, uh, music publishers and everything else um, realize that, boy, they, they should really try to get control of how people distribute and use what they produce. And, and not too long ago, I think it was... Reuters. Um, I, I heard somebody say something. It was, it was, hmm? The AP uh, made an announcement of, uh, you know, they were going to start um, um, uh, putting strong digital rights management in all their their wire articles, and and they had this vision, this this PowerPointy slide kind of vision um, for uh, 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 how this was all going to work, and. Um, Anybody with a dose of technical chops knows that this is lunacy, right? And uh, it could not possibly ever work. And um, so some, some technologist somewhere had told, had sold the AP something crazy, something that could never possibly work. And John Gruber at Daring Fireball referred, he said, I, I love this line, he said, uh, um, you know, AP just got sold some magic beans. Um, a lot of enterprise tools, I think, are selling magic beans. Enterprise tools often have impenetrable shells. They might do deep magic inside, but in the effort of being easy to use or perhaps easy to train people to use, because that, that's one of the things that vendors are on the hook for, right, is to train developers to use their tools, um, they have a, a simplified API or a declarative API or configuration checkboxes and, and a, a tightly constrained list of things that you can do. It might be a big list, but nevertheless, it's not extensible. This is what this tool will do, and you can get it to do this and that and the other and this list of 50 things, but what if it's, what if the one thing you need today is not on there? Um, most of the tools that we tend to know and love, well, um, so one example of this is plotting and reporting and charting packages. Um, there's a whole family of them, and they're usually declarative um, in, in either, you know, through a graphical user interface or through some sort of language. Um, you declare what you want this chart to be and where you want it to get the data and how it, how it should be plotted and things like that. And um, uh, as long as you are happy with the, uh, the different kinds of plots that it provides, you're in good shape. But if you want to do something a little fancier, um, you're not. And um, there are tools, and they're more programmer-oriented tools, and they tend not to have as fancy sales brochures, but they're tools with what I like to call um, an onion skin API, where there's a nice simplified constrained outer layer but then there's an escape hatch, and you can peel that back and get to the, low, the next lower level API that that outer API is built on. And that's documented too. And so you can take a little bit more control if you want to. And then you can peel that back. Does this sound like anything that people in this room know? Coco? Active record? Active record? That's my favorite example. Active record, you can peel back as much as you want and get down to the level of just throwing raw SQL in there. Do you want to do that all the time? No. But on every project I've ever worked on with Active Record, there was probably at least one query where we ended up throwing a reasonably complicated SQL fragment in. Um, it's not, uh, to use um, Dick Gabriel's words, it's not the right thing. It's not clean and pure and nice and architecturally uh, pleasant. But um, it's extremely pragmatic and it lets developers move fast and get what they would need to do done in a reasonably clean way, um, and it doesn't take the power away from us, which is the most important thing. They'll come at you sideways. It's how they think, it's how they move. Sidle up and smile, hit you where you're weak. The sort of man they're like to send believes hard, kills and never asks for it. Um, a lot of enterprise tools 
a lot of enterprise tools force us to come at problems sideways. Um, integration tools are particularly like this. Um, I want to communicate with that thing over there. Great. Um, it's got an API, and we've got an API, and it's got a data format, and we've got a data format. And if you'll just buy this integration bus that sits in the middle, all you've got to do is make that tool communicate with the integration bus, and then make your thing communicate with the integration bus, and you're set. Okay. And the beauty of it is, if you ever need to get other things to communicate with those two things, you know, it's already there and you have this one common format that you can use across your enterprise. Well, the problem is that right now we just need to get from here to there. And in sticking this integration bus in the middle um, takes us sideways. And really it doesn't simplify the problem at all. It just doubles it. Now instead of making him talk, A talk to B, you need to make A talk to C and B talk to C. And in my experience, and I've worked in a lot of enterprise software uh, situations, um, that, that future scenario of you need to make other things talk to all of these things um, uh, somehow doesn't really ever come to pass. Not enough to make it worth all this sideways effort. Some tools come with their own ecosystems. So let's talk about Finnish robot overlord tools. <laughs> name, a to name, name an enterprise tool that sort of accretes its own uh, ecosystem within an enterprise. All of you are familiar with them. Oracle. WebSphere, Oracle, Active Directory, Active Directory. Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails. <laughs> we'll take this outside. What? Unicenter, um, clear case. <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't have to convince me. Um, and, and this is one of the things that we really uh, recognized a lot. I want to show you, um, I've got permission from Verizon to show you this. Um, I want to show you uh, something we did, a, a model we built. Um, we, started, we started building uh, a model of incentives. Remember, I, I talked about the, um, um, the whole, um, I think it's probably over here, actually. We talked about the whole um, uh, story of manufacturing and inventory being counted as a, an asset rather than, than a liability. And I think there are a lot of similar stories in enterprise software situations where um, the way people account for things, the way budgets are, are controlled, and the way uh, results are evaluated and, and performance uh, put all kinds of negative incentives in place. And we started trying to model this um, using an interesting tool called Flying Logic. And, and there's this giant awful model. And uh, let me turn on mirroring here so I can figure out how. I can't figure out how. I've got a new laptop. Um, it used to be just a key I'd push. Um, so we started modeling this, and this is a, a giant horrible model, and we think we're about 10% done with modeling incentives and, and uh, dependencies within large, typical large IT organizations. And um, so I want to collapse some of this. And zero in on this one box called tools and blow that up. So let me just do it this way. So in the back, you won't be able to see a lot of this, but I'll, uh, I'll point it out to you. So there's all kinds of different, different things we, we plotted out here. And there's one I want to focus on uh, of how tool enterprise tools um, uh, cause problems, and, and we're particularly talking about really expensive ones that uh, have their own ecosystems. Um, volume purchase agreements have price benefits for the enterprise. We like to think of the, this all being, you know, all happening because um, the, uh, the CIO likes to play golf, you know, and the Oracle salesman goes out and plays golf and buys him drinks. And, and um, sometimes that happens, but it's not always that nefarious. I mean, um, the, the People who do control the purchasing for large enterprise groups fall prey to the same kind of marketing baloney that we do 
um, when, you know, it's like, hey, it's on sale. I could save money. I didn't know I needed it five minutes ago, but, you know, it's on sale. I can save money. So you have things like, you know, well, we can use MySQL for free or buy Oracle and save $100,000. <laughs> right? <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> so what this means is that companies buy these enterprise licenses and, and uh, they, buy, you, they get a site license. And, and um, but that means that the IT departments have to create groups around those tools because they, they require this kind of support structure. And so again, we, like, we, we typically think of it in a simplistic way as, well, it's a sunk cost and the company wants to make good on that cost and somebody will look, you know, really stupid if we spend all this money on Oracle and nobody uses it. But again, it's often a lot more complicated than that. And so they create these groups around the tools and um, it has all kinds of other negative effects. Getting results from the tools requires engagements from the tools group. And um, if, if people don't want to use it, it's more than just the guy who was responsible for the purchase looks stupid. The people who are controlling the tool start to fear for their jobs, right? And they, they're agitating for wider use of this so that they can stay employed. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of other things here, and I won't go into all of it because you probably don't care that much. But um, uh, we, we really found that um, tools that have their own ecosystems are a horrible cause of inertia um, in large organizations. And uh, um, tools that are sort of human scale and that programmers can understand and install and deal with and manage and control themselves um, are valuable precisely because they avoid the need for tool-related groups within the IT organization and uh, uh, all the things that, that, all the bad things that come with those. A lot of enterprise tools treat the symptoms. And I'm going to speed up here a little bit, uh, but I'm going to just give one example which is near and dear to my heart, which is um, rules engines. How many of you have worked with rules engines? How many of you think they worked really well for the situation where you used them? Uh, I'd love to hear your story. Um, so uh, I think there's a place for rules engines. I, I think they are applicable to certain domains and um, when I use them I like to build a good domain model and encapsulate the rules engine behind part of that where it really makes sense. But often rules engines are touted as sort of being right at the center of an enterprise architecture. And um, so I'm talking about treating the symptoms and the reason rules engines sell, as near as I can tell, more than anything, um, is because um, business people want, can, want to be able to change uh, uh, business rules more quickly and by themselves, without having to involve the IT group and programmers. Um, all of which sounds okay, um, until uh, a few months down the track, the, um, the business starts to learn why the IT group has certain processes in place. And, and really these rules represent the logic of the application, and those rules can be buggy, and uh, those rules need to be uh, reviewed and tested and, and uh, their deployment into production needs to be controlled at least a little bit and um, often rules engines, every time in my experience that rules engines have been really strongly advocated in a large IT setting, um, they were treating a symptom rather than the problem and the symptom was that um, the business people couldn't get changes into the system fast enough but the real problem was that for whatever reason the IT, IT group was not responsive enough. And uh, the best answer in that case is uh, to work on making the IT group more responsive. Um, the, bringing the rules engine in has all kinds of, of you know, problems because basically the business people are now in a sense managing source code and, uh, and they don't have the, the tools or the processes in place to do that effectively. But also it uh, um, kind of makes the IT group defensive and uh, uh, postpones dealing with the real problem, which is that they're not responsive enough. 
Enterprise tools end up sticking the IT organization in a time bubble. Um, enterprise tools are big and unwieldy, usually, and the cycle of getting them into the, um, uh, into the enterprise takes a long time. Uh, you have to go through a survey to choose a tool, and then the purchasing process goes on, and then comes uh, training and a learning curve, and then the long period where the tool snakes its tendrils into every part of the organization. And um, by this time, months have gone by. How many different web server technologies have the Rails uh, community gone through in that amount of time? Uh, by the time one tool gets into a sizable enterprise, I think we, we raced through uh, Lighty and Fast CGI and Mongrel and Thin and, and uh, now we're on to Unicorn. And, um, so um, part of the goal of enterprise tools is actually to slow down innovation and slow down experimentation and be more cautious. And I can actually see that sometimes that's a valuable goal but meanwhile, the general pace of, uh, of innovation and change in the software world is increasing. And uh, IT groups and, and enterprises are falling farther and farther behind all the time. Um, they're, they're thinking they're pretty hot now because they're adopting Java in a lot of cases. Those are the worst of them, but it's true. There are a lot out there that are like that. Solving people problems with technology. I don't need to uh, talk about that one too much. Um, just aiming for too much control. Um, once you get above a very large size at all, uh, command and control doesn't work. Um, when, when even the US military understands that centralized command and control is not a bad idea, um, it's time to start looking for something else. And a lot of enterprise tools are about preventing people from making mistakes. And um, if you prevent people from making stupid things, uh, from, from doing stupid things, that's usually good. But the problem is that it usually uh, comes at the expense of also uh, preventing people from doing certain smart things. And um, far, better, far better than control is the combination of facilitation and feedback. Don't make it difficult for people to, to do things uh, in fear that they might make a mistake. Make it easy for them to do things, and at the same time, make sure you get rapid feedback so that mistakes can be seen and caught quickly and corrected uh, before too much is lost. Obviously, there are places in the process where mistakes are more costly than others, and you need controls around some of those. But in general, facilitation and feedback is a better choice. And the typical enterprise tool is more oriented towards control. So we're back to the manifesto again. And um, uh, I started this with a question about uh, you know, why this is and why we all say we buy that when really we all love our tools. And um, I would like to suggest that when you see this, you think about a corollary to that first one, which is, um, you know, yes, we believe in individuals and interactions over process and processes and tools, and as a part of that, since we need tools to make us more effective, we value tools that enable people over tools that control and constrain, just like these. Thank you very much.